once this rate is super low, once everyone is uh, pricing in growth really highly, right? Like when, once there's a bull market, rates are super low, they're near zero. Everyone is like making money hand over fist, right? Like you guys remember everything. You don't need motorcycle loans. You don't, you don't need, you, we're actually in the greatest technology sector in, in the world. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research. Before we dive into today's episode with Sam Kazmian, the uh, founder of Frax, or one of the core contributors to the protocol, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Hexens, the most hardcore security team in Web3, pioneering in ZK and novel, novel cryptography. Hexens is trusted by tier one protocols like Polygon, including their work on their ZK AVM. Uh, Mantle, Risk Zero, Lido, One Inch, New Bank, and more. You'll hear more about them a little bit later in the show, but today is October 13th, and we're very excited to have this conversation with Sam. So, Sam, thanks for joining us. It's always a pleasure to be with you guys. Awesome, awesome. So, Frax obviously is definitely taking kind of the more vertically integrated uh, approach, which is super cool to see. Not many protocols in the the space are doing that. So, wanted to get your take on uh, Frax V3 some of the changes Frax has undergone over the past year or two. Um, and yeah, if you could just set the stage there and we, we can dive a little bit deeper into the individual components. For sure. Yeah. Um, we, we have a, like a unique view on like how we build stuff as, as stable coins or as like stable coin stability mechanism. So that's why there's uh, a few of this stuff like Frax Lend and, and the Curve AMOs and stuff. But just for like viewers uh, listening, Frax V3 is the, the new version of, the Frax dollar peg stable coin. Uh, we like to call it, it's the, the, the final stable coin design, so to speak, or other people have said it's like an all weather uh, stable coin in terms of, we think this completes the, the dollar pegged stable coin design. Um, and what I mean by that is if you have a stable coin issued uh, that's pegged to the US dollar, what you want to do is you want the stable coin to act like real US dollars in every kind of market condition right? And in high rates, right? When the issuer of the US dollar itself, the US government, the Federal Reserve actually pays high interest rates uh, for people to hold it, as well as in low rates, which when they pay near zero or zero uh, for people to actually use the dollars as, as a medium of exchange, right? And what we decided to do is uh, we wanted to have Frax V3 basically able to work exactly as designed before with a few new unique innovations, but as well as bring on the dollar yield curve, right? From, from the near yield curve, right? Which is like uh, short dated treasuries or just the IORB rate, uh, the interest on reserve balances for people that, that aren't in, into like finance and stuff, which is a federal reserve rate. That number that Jerome Powell comes out, uh, you know, every month and he says, oh, the IORB, the rate will like rise by, you know, 0.2 or 0.25% or whatever. That's called the IORB rate, the interest on reserve balances. We wanted to design a stable coin that brings all of those things on chain in as uh, decentralized uh, but, but proper manner as possible, uh, as well as have all of the innovations that the Frax stable coin has had uh, in, in V2, basically protocol and liquidity able to manage on chain liquidity, uh, able to have over collateralized safe crypto loans, right? The, the thing that uh, MakerDAO basically originated and it's uh, different kinds of flavors, right? Um, and so Frax V3 kind of neatly places all of those in like an elegant way that we think uh, no one's, you know, done before. I love that. That really sets the stage for just the vision of, of why you're kind of moving to the to this Frax V3 model. And I love that you're referring to it as kind of the end state, because that's always been a question that I try to ask is, you know, what's the end state here? Uh, so it's fun to actually like really dive into what that's going to be. And so one of the core ideas here is moving to a fully collateralized stablecoin. And that kind of differs from the under collateralized nature of the token in the past. And so I kind of want to get your ideas around like what drove the change in approach here, since it's a bit of a change in tune. Uh, and what are the trade-offs in capital efficiency, which was like long touted as this really, really strong benefit of having this, you know, marginally under collateralized stablecoin? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Frax did extremely well uh, during the previous, you know, bull market or, or the growth phase of crypto uh, because of our capital efficient nature, as well as just having uh, a lot of collateralization, but also able to be capital efficient, but not too crazy and, and weird like Terra and then the way that that all ended, right? And as we grow bigger, 
uh, and we grow more important and, and people use fracks and, and these kinds of things. I think uh, our view, or at least my view, is that if you want to create a very, very large uh, stable coin, you know, we're really a long-term oriented team thinking in the next three to five to 10 years, right? Next decade of crypto, you want to basically become safer as you get bigger, not the other way around, right? You don't want to become riskier as, as you get bigger because that, that's not a recipe for, for a good ending, right? You can kind of do these kind of growth strategies or like uh, try to take kind of market share. Like when we launched Frax, right? Everyone was like, why, why does Frax need to exist? Why don't we use DAI or use USDC and, and these kinds of things? And because of Frax's unique design, we're able to propel ourselves up there, right? And now like Frax is, you know, a uh, top five stable coin. And so we answered that question. Why? Because it's more capital efficient, it's, it's better, you can yield farm with it, and it doesn't go to zero like, like Terra, right? Um, and so, but now if, if we're going to go up to the billions and tens of billions and in the co coming years, uh, hopefully with stable coins going to hundreds of billions and we want to be uh, up there, right? You can't have the same exact structure. And that, that's actually an interesting thing to think about because as people use money, you want it to be safer, right? You want the money itself, the thing that people use as like a unit of account that has uh, their debt denominated in it, right? That they save in. Uh, you don't want that to possibly go poof overnight, right? Um, it's, it's the same issue that people, you know, criticize traditional banking and right. Like without FDIC bailouts or something like that, if, if a bank is, is not fully backed by real dollars and like really long dated loans or like, you know, mark to market, if they're insolvent, right. Like we saw with, uh, Silicon Valley bank and a bunch of other banks earlier in the year, uh, that's like a recipe for disaster, right? So the bigger you get, you want to be, uh, safer. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And I, I love that you mentioned uh, kind of that duration mismatch because I, it's something I definitely want to get into later in the episode. But uh, if we look at CR today or the collateralization ratio, it's around 92%. So what's going to be the difference maker to fill that gap? And do you have like an idea for how long that should take? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so for people that don't know, Frax is, like you said, fully transitioning uh, to 100% CR of exogenous collateral, which means outside collateral, the actual governance token and stuff does not count uh, as collateralization. Um, mainly uh, protocol revenue. It's not like there's just a bunch of you know governance tokens being sold or anything. Uh, as you said, Frax is a bunch of different uh, lines of sub protocols. Uh, we call them sub protocols. MakerDAO actually has a cool term, sub DAOs. Uh, it turns out we're kind of both working on similar uh, concept the, the whole time. So we have an uh, LSD, um, we call, like to call it an ETHPEG stablecoin. We have Frax Chain coming uh, at the end of the year. Um, and so we have just a lot of stuff. And even just in these markets, Frax makes about between 30 to 40. Uh, million dollars of annual revenue, counting everything, the CRV from protocol and liquidity, lending, all this stuff. Uh, hopefully that'll be even higher with, you know, a Frax Chain L2 uh, and, and these kinds of things. But I think that one thing that's important is Frax has a lot of locked liquidity, which means our, our like gauge system, slightly different from Curve, allows people to lock uh, liquidity between one to three years. And so if you actually just go on chain and look at it, like you don't have to trust me on this call or anything, and you look at the locked liquidity, like Frax paired with DAI, with USDC, with all these other tokens, uh, there's actually uh, years, one to two and a half years of locked liquidity. That means that uh, in balance sheet reporting, it's, it's an asset because the side that is... Uh, a, like DAI USDC users can actually sell its guaranteed liquidity. It's almost like a redemption through a third mechanism, right? And so for for years from now, even though I don't expect it to take years, you ask Dan how long it'll take, uh, there is no mathematical possibility of like a bank run uh, or anything like that. Uh, barring, you know, obviously like smart contract risk or something really unexpected happening. Um, so that's why Frax has been super stable because we've been uh, very, very transparent. We have actually a live balance sheet of all the Frax collateral that literally updates every block. Uh, and so if there was some kind of like hidden 
problem where like if enough market actors right now, as you know, as we're saying this or something, were deemed fracks and it would all come crashing down or something, that would have happened months ago, right? I'm, I'm of the belief that like uh, markets are efficient. Uh, we actually try to help and tend towards efficiency by pushing out as much information as possible. And uh, because the information is good, you know, things are, are good. <laughs> And so, yeah, you mentioned MakerDAO and some of the similarities between your protocols. And there are, there are of course, uh, are many of those. And uh, one thing they do is they have like the surplus bluffer. And right now they're returning some yield to their SDI token. Um, and when, they go, when the surplus bluffer rises over a certain amount, uh, then actually some of that will be used to kind of be essentially distributed back to the MKR token through the, a, a special mechanism that they're using. We don't, obviously don't need to go into the details there. But if we fast forward to the estate for FRAX where the CR is 100, um, will that kind of see a similar relationship where in some form or fashion, the, some of those excess profits will flow back to the VE FXS uh, stakers? Yeah. Uh, in fact, not only that, but I think because, like you said, FRAX is very like, uh vertically integrated and internally with a lot of sub protocols maker actually has two and there's three or four coming we have uh you know frax eth frax chain itself uh frax swap and and everything here and there's actually more stuff that you know like bam and, and and things like that that uh could be separate discussions uh itself but vefxs is the staking system as you guys know very well uh for fxs it's kind of similar, inspired by by Curve. I think it was like the second major token after VCRV to kind of uh, use that system. Everything that is uh, excess profit, as you said, above the CR right now, most of the revenue goes to uh, on the balance sheet to actually increase the CR. However, there's there's a small amount, uh, you know, twenty to thirty thousand dollars of of revenue that's pushed out on VFX as it does not have like a zero yield, but it could have much, much higher yield, right? Think about staking a governance token that has like a, a specific type of roll up. It has a, a lending market issues, one of the largest stable coins itself, uh, and also one of the largest LSDs. I think Frax ETH is number four uh, largest LSDs. And one thing that I like to say about these kind of sub protocols and, and all of this ecosystem is that they're entirely, they excel in any kind of uh, economic environment. And so, for example, during high rates, what's been doing really well? MakerDAO's MKR token, right? Because they have a dollar peg stable coin. They're able to access that off-chain IORB, that Fed rate, right? And they're, you know, giving out uh, a good amount of it through the DSR. And Maker, that the governance token has gone on a massive run, right? During high rates, this is the exact type of you know, protocol or, or business, however you want to term it, type of thing that you actually want to, uh, you know, be, be in, right? And during low rates, you want to be in the high growth, innovative technology business, right? Like LSDs, like, like rollups, like blockchains. Remember when ETH, it was, it costs like $30 to transfer ERC20 token and the ETH protocol every day was burning like, what was it like? tens of eight figures or some, something crazy of, of like ETH uh, per day, right? And, it, you know, the annual projected revenue was in the billions of, of like for, for the ETH protocol itself, right? Now, thankfully, it's super cheap to, to send tokens and stuff, but that also means in high rates, the, the blockchain business, so to speak, right? Like block space is much cheaper, but if you have a dollar business, so to speak, a stablecoin protocol, you excel, right? And so if you look at Frax's uh, spectrum of assets, what VFXS uh, holders basically control, govern, and, and essentially uh, ha have a right to, um, you see that it's a very, very wide spectrum of, of things, right? And so that's actually super important to us. We wanted to make sure that uh, no matter what happens, the, the Frax kind of ecosystem is uh, systemically very important. Um, and so sometimes some people in crypto get, get kind of nervous when they hear systemically important or like, uh, too big to fail or something. But again, with, it's a decentralized system, right? You could argue maybe Ethereum is, is systemically important, but it's a fully decentralized blockchain. Same thing with Frax. If we build Frax Lend, it's not like a centralized lending system, right? It's an autonomous decentralized lending system. If Frax ETH actually uh, the, the V2 is fully decentralized in every way, right? So even though we're trying to be kind of everywhere, so to speak, in, in every kind of uh, thing, it's all still built in fully 
uh, decentralized permissionless systems. Yeah, I actually, I, I really do love the approach you guys are taking by diversifying your product suite and kind of making the ecosystem more anti-cyclical, if you will, uh, as blockchain and crypto is is extremely cyclical <laughs> so far. So I love to hear that. But uh, you mentioned uh, how important it is to keep a, a stable coin pegged to $1. So under Frax V3, what are the mechanisms, mechanisms in place to ensure that uh, it is always trading at $1? Yeah, definitely. So uh, Frax V3, first of all, it works similar to uh, Frax V2 in the AMOs, right? Protocol control liquidity on like Curve, uh, minting Frax into lending markets like Frax Lend so that people are able to over collateralize Frax up to points that like governance allows minting and lending caps. It's very similar to a lot of the, the same mechanics. There's two new things uh, that Frax V3 introduces that I think most people will be thinking about during this kind of you know high rate environment. One is the staked Frax, the S Frax Volt, which targets the IORB rate if you if you lend into it, and then uh, the Frax Bonds FXB tokens, which are basically uh, essentially kind of like zero coupon utility tokens. They convert to Frax stable coins at a specific timestamp. So you can kind of think of them like treasury bills, but they're not tokenized in terms of that you don't have a right to treasury bills or anything. They're just fully on-chain systems that convert to uh, frac stable coins. And so one thing uh, I, I kind of wanted to um, explain is that because Frax now has like a real world asset strategy, uh, some kind of similar to Maker, a little bit different, um, we actually have our, our own pipeline, our own partners, our own custodians. So we have a public benefit corporation called FinRES BBC. And the idea behind this is it actually can build the off-chain relationships. It can have brokers, it can have trust uh, protected assets. It can have the same kind of uh, relationships that a real uh, corporation can have. And the final goal with this uh, is that once there's regulatory clarity, once there's like actual stablecoin bills that pass Congress or like the the current way that stable coins work are enshrined into law, uh, and I'm a believer that they will be right. There's a, there's a skeptical view that this this will never be there. You know, super illegal or whatever. I think if that's the correct view that happens in in history, then we're we're all doing this wrong. We're we're in the wrong uh, industry. So the, our whole bet is that that that's wrong. But so once this actually happens. Our final goal for this public benefit corporation is to have a Fed master account, which means an actual depository account at one of the United States Federal Reserve Banks uh, that can actually get the IORB rate, which is what the definition of the IORB rate is, the interest on reserve balances that, that Fed banks pay. And so that's our real world asset strategy for Frax V3, right? And just, you know, going forward. And, and uh, it's not a real world asset strategy of like deploying capital to emerging markets or like, uh, I don't know, like now there's like the infamous motorcycle loans or something. Uh, and, and the idea, again, like I was saying, is for it to get safer over time. That's why our goal is to get an FMA once there's regulatory clarity, once there's some enshrined stablecoin uh, laws, whether they take years or, or not, right? Um, the whole point is that the real world asset strategy can tap into uh, the risk-free rate, the IORB rate, and, and as close to uh, possible. We're not trying to fund, you know, renewable energy in different markets. We're not trying to, basically, we're not trying to back uh, the frac stablecoin with anything that can default on, on its debt, right? The only thing that can't default on its debt is the issuer of the thing that the debt is denominated in, right? So which is the, the, the dollar is issued by the US government, the Federal Reserve specifically. The only thing that, you know, most likely cannot default, uh, although there was a, an interesting scare with the debt ceiling earlier this year as well, uh, is the federal government of the United States, right? And so that's our real world asset strategy. Our real world asset strategy is very uh, narrow. It does not mean that we're gonna slowly try to expand to uh, random like other things. Uh, it's a very, very safe. Uh, in fact, I, I, I might just, you know, I call it the single real world asset strategy, which is there's only one real world asset like you need on chain, which is the, the IORB rate, the risk-free rate, right? Because think about it. Once, 
once the IORB rate is super high, right? It's like 5% right now, maybe it goes higher, maybe it stays really high for a while. You need that rate. It's basically the most important like interest rate that's grounded in the real world economy, right? That that's grounded in like the price of oil, the price of labor and all these things that blockchains are not, right? It's the blockchains are just digital like cyberspace, right? And once this rate is super low, once everyone is uh, pricing in growth really highly, right? Like when, once there's a bull market, rates are super low, they're near zero. Everyone is like making money hand over fist, right? Like you guys remember everything. You don't need motorcycle loans. You don't, you don't need, you, we're actually in the greatest technology sector in, in the world, right? Like crypto, uh, digital assets, all this stuff, the intersection of, digital assets, AI and everything, once growth premiums come back and rates go very low, uh, you don't need real world assets, right? Like the, the, the best assets are here on chain, right? If, if everyone remembers, like people were willing to pay like 10 to 15% to borrow USDC and stables on Aave and, and Compound because everyone wanted exposure to high growth, innovative, interesting digital assets, protocols, and all these things, right? Those are the environments that are super simple, right? Like th those, we're all, we're all good. We're, we're in the perfect area. It's only during extremely high rates, like you were talking about, the cyclical uh, type of situation where this part of the cycle, you need this singular rate that's efficient, scalable on chain. And if you can get that, you kind of complete the full, full loop, right? The, the full uh, design. And think about it, right now is not the time either that you want to uh, loan to emerging economies and stuff. That's when they're also all defaulting, right? So that's the way we think about it. And so like one thing for people to take away from this is Frax V3's real world asset strategy is a singular one. Uh, it's the Fed rate. It's the, um, the yield curve of dollars and treasuries uh, on chain. So that, that's basically it. I, I love that explanation. And there's like those two points you hit on. I, I kind of want to elaborate on quickly. And of course, we'll get definitely get into SFRAX and, and F FXB after this. But uh, I like that you call it this like singular approach because it's singular in another sense too, in that everything is running through one entity with FinRes PBC. Um, and I find that super, super interesting because again, if you look at MakerDAO, you know, they have all these different uh, partners in, in, you know, kind of pairing with these off-chain assets and it makes reporting an absolute mess. Uh, and this is like, that's kind of one of their big pain points. And this seems to be really, really honing in on, on improving on one of these big pain points. So I, I do have a quick question on specifically on that, which is how does having just this one entity change the reporting, right? Like, like how do you get the, cause you know, obviously they're off-chain assets. And so how do you get that information about off-chain assets back on chain? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So first thing, so yeah, we have a, uh, Delaware C Corporation, very similar. It's a, it's a U.S. corporation. Uh, again, our, our bet is that crypto will will be great in the U.S. and globally, everything. Um, and it's a public benefit corporation. The same thing like Optimism PBC or all of these kinds of things. And the, the reason it's a public benefit corporation is it does not try to maximize uh, revenue or profit by like doing these uh, deals with like the Frax protocol. Um, it basically is a public benefit of interacting with the Frax protocol and DAO and then having real world relationships that are able to execute on this, you know, singular real world asset strategy. Like it's not trying to increase its equity value, do raises and, and these kinds of things. And eventually the, the reason the structure exists is, like I said, eventually the goal is if this can be a public uh, resource, right, to get a Fed master account and be able to actually bring the IORB rate on chain in a compliant, proper manner, then this is a huge victory, right? And you can't actually do that in any other kind of structure, like you said, otherwise you'd have to work with just various third parties and, and things like that. Um, so that, that's what motivated us to, to do it like this. So first of all, uh, and second of all, the reporting is something we take super seriously, right? Whenever, like you said, it's off chain, uh, it's never going to ever uh, satisfy 100% of people just because there's no way to 
uh, actually mathematically confirm everything, right? That people can be like, well, the auditors are in cahoots with them, or they didn't know this, or even just like the, the FTX thing, you could, you know, people can say you tricked the auditors or something like that, right? Uh, a poorly labeled fiat account, right? Like for, from the, the FTX stuff. Uh, but our goal is to actually basically have a real-time balance sheet of both the on-chain assets, which is super easy. It's already there. It's facts.frax.finance. And then also integrate uh, things like played and APIs that report bank balances, brokerage balances, and all these things, and then immediately have them and combine them with the, the on-chain uh, balance sheet on facts.frax.finance. So you can actually see literally day by day everything that is the, the assets. And I think that's very important uh, because you can't really do that if there's uh, a bunch of different third parties that don't at, at least go through one uh, final, you know, uh, off-chain custodian like Finra SPBC or something like that. Because they'll they'll all they'll all report in some other different way. They might post a PDF. They might have a monthly situation. They might do this or that. But here we can actually build the reporting. Uh, infrastructure as we onboard like different types of partners and things with FinRES BBC. Yeah, and that's actually a great flag. We'll for sure put the link uh, in the show notes to facts.frax.finance because it's an incredible site which you guys have built. Um, and the other thing I wanted to jam on really quickly was, you know, you mentioned that not only the protocol as a whole is kind of built for this this uh, cyclical nature of the industry, but if you zoom in on just the Frax stablecoin itself, you know, like it too is kind of now getting built uh, on this same spectrum of like high risk assets like crypto and low risk assets like, uh, you know, T-bills and, and cash, cash like equivalents. And so one thing I'm just not like I haven't really grasped yet is how does the collateral backing of Frax stablecoin change when the IOR, IORB rate increases, let's say, like how does the how do the assets actually shift from like, uh, you know, crypto assets and into uh, these RWA assets? Yeah, definitely. And in fact, this is so we just actually launched Frax V3 uh, two days ago on Wednesday. And so it's uh, obviously there's a bunch of people uh, using S Frax way more than uh, we we're expecting in like the first 12 hours, which is great. Um, but as this keeps going, um, I actually think that what, what I'm seeing is exactly as you're saying, this kind of fluid movement between, you know, the on chain, you know, over collateralized loans, protocol and liquidity to uh, off-chain, you know, T-bills, cash equivalents based on market demand, right? So the, the way that it works right now is the more people stake in SFRAX, right, the IORB vault, uh, that FRAX that they stake is, is able to be converted to USDC fiat or something else, and then uh, goes to cash equivalents, right? Uh, and then that yield that's generated to, to close to the IORB rate gets returned to the vault uh, once every week, right? As the IORB rate increases, you can imagine more and more people will just take their frax and, and want access to this uh, essentially close to risk free rate, right? The IORB. And that actually pushes the, the frax collateralization to become more cash equivalent. It essentially becomes kind of like a fiat coin of sorts, right? And it's almost like the, the design is fluid uh, because once that staking vault goes up, right? Anywhere that you lend Frax, like Frax Lend, Ave, or all these things, you wouldn't lend it if unless the interest rate was above the IORB rate, right? So you pull it out, people pull out uh, from all these lending protocols to go and get this risk-free, uh, you know, 5 five percentish IORB rate, right? And so it actually changes the collateralization backing based on market demand for uh, the, the risk-free rate, right? And it, it's just this fluid system. And then as the IORB rate goes down, right, let's say it's going to go back down to zero. Uh, I think that would be great because that'd be the start of a, probably a new uh, bull market cycle. But as people pull out of there, right, what happens is they either lend on, on a lending market, right, because interest rates are up to, to borrow and go long on, you know, digital assets and, and, and growth premium on these things, right? or they might redeem their frax, right? And, and they might sell it. And what happens is the exact reverse. The cash equivalents get sold for fiat, fiat to like USDC, USDP, uh, all, all these things. And then the, the AMOs push the on-chain liquidity. So people are able to sell their, their frax through, through Curve, through uh, Uni V3 and all these things. Um, and then, then it becomes more crypto collateralized, right? Just naturally. And so um, when we started frax, 
the the name was a portmanteau of fractional and like algorithmic like this hybrid model between like collateralization and uh you know like un, under collateralization which you know is not the the way we're going we're going right as as we grow i actually think we did name it right but, but it's it's a hybrid model but not of algorithmic and uh collateralized it's a hybrid model of crypto collateralized and fiat collateralized based on the the real world interest rate of the dollar so it, it is kind of fractional but not the type of fractional that we thought it's it's hybrid between crypto collateralization and and uh, fiat collateralization so like it's kind of come full circle frax is a hybrid stable coin uh we just didn't know we're we're founding it and creating it in in this way which is kind of cool i love that i love that long-term thinkers you're ahead of your time <laughs> All roads lead to Frax, as as you guys say over there. <laughs> I want to give a quick shout out to Hexens. As we explore today's blockchain landscape, let's take a moment to recognize them as a premier cybersecurity provider in Web3. Hexens is trusted by tier one projects like Polygon, including a security review on their new Polygon ZK EVM, Mantle, Risk Zero, Lido, One Inch, New Bank, and more. Get a deep dive into your technology stack with the most comprehensive analysis and cybersecurity consulting. Hexens not only uses widely known methods methodologies and flows, but discovers and introduces new ones on a day-to-day -day basis. With over $55 billion secured, they cover everything from smart contracts to blockchain to Web2 pen tests. Yeah, there's been nearly $7 billion of total value hacked in crypto's nascent history, so it's safe to say your team has a lot on the line. Don't skimp out, take your security seriously, and reach out to Hexens. Don't forget to mention 0x Research for a free Web2 pen test with your partnership, and reach out to Hexens at hexens.io. Find them in the links in the show notes, or reach out to them at Permissionless. They'll be at booth 832. Uh, but without further ado, let's get back to today's episode. Uh, I do have one more question before I let Dan go uh, go crazy with the S Frax and FXB questions. But a common ridicule of Frax has been reliance on multisig. But you guys are launching or have recently launched. Maybe you can clear that up. Uh, a governance module. How does that change things in that regard? Yeah. So we took a while to develop Frax Gov. Uh, it's a it's a module that basically makes it so that uh, any kind of uh, feature, which is whether it's a, a proposal to like rebalance AMOs or like move collateral or things like that, uh, has to be on chain. Like that transaction has to be pushed on chain and it has to be either vetoed or uh, allowed a time lock to pass to be able to be executed. And basically, contract by contract, uh, you add the, the Frax Gov module as like the admin. Um, and so we're slowly releasing that over a number of months as we're more and more uh, confident of it. So for example, actually, FraxGov is already out. It's on chain. You can actually see it in, in the UI. Uh, FraxLend AMO and, and FraxLend entirely controlled by, by FraxGov. Like as we speak, like there's no way, for example, for a, a MSIG uh, to basically be like, oh, we're going to mint a bunch of Frax into this uh, FraxLend pair and then like let whoever has the collateral to just run away with a bunch of stable coins. That's not possible. So like Frax Lend, for example, entirely uh, governed on chain, decentralized, and we're slowly moving things uh, over to the Frax Gov module. For example, when we launched the Frax ETH V2 system, uh, as you guys are probably aware, all of the contracts deployed there, uh, we're, we're planning on from day one, just having the Frax Gov module be the uh, admin controller, right? This on chain governance. Uh, fully controlled by the FXS holders, no trust needed in terms of uh, any kind of signers or anything. And yes, uh, common criticism, there's always criticism and trade-offs of everything, right? Common uh, concern there is, well, can the team, the team can't act fast in terms of uh, uh, emergencies. It's like, no, we can't. So like that, that's one thing. Right now, if there was an emergency, like there are MSIGs on certain contracts. We could act immediately without like anyone, you know, uh, having to stop us on certain contracts to to actually fix things or if there was some critical thing. Uh, for like Fraxland, we can't. It's it's now now it's just you know at, at least it takes forty eight hours. And um, you guys might remember Compound had this issue of uh, their like comp tokens were like over emitted or something like that. There was some kind of bug uh, about 18 months ago or close to two years ago or something. And they couldn't fix it because they're, they're fully decentralized on chain. Everything has to go through 
on-chain governance. And uh, I think it was like for two or three days, like something, you know, there was just like, I think of what, like $50,000 of comp emitted every hour or something, which was supposed to only be uh, a week. Thankfully, what people in loose funds, it was just like a bunch of uh, compound tokens were like over emitted. Uh, but yeah, that that's part of the problem of uh, trade-off of, of being fully on chain and not needing to trust any compound core devs. So uh, Frax is systematically using the Frax Gov module. Frax Lend is already like that. Frax ETH V2, once the contracts are deployed, is planning on uh, being like that. Frax V3, the uh, FXB contracts and stuff, they'll all be fully Frax Gov uh, coordinated. So again, all of the, the new things that roll out, fully on chain, fully decentralized, uh, no you know, no MSIG trust required. And of course, yes, for before anyone thinks, yes, we can't uh, fix any issues very quickly. And it also becomes public. So that that's, there's always that trade off. Really appreciate you kind of diving into the trade offs there. I feel like, you know, sometimes the risks of these things don't get fully, fully stated. And, you know, we even have seen like, Emergency DAOs kind of still not really have the ability to act. A great example of that is the you know the curve reentrancy exploit when the we had the bug in the uh, Viper compiler. Yeah, there's a curve emergency DAO, but it doesn't have the ability to halt pools or halt withdrawals from from these pools because that kind of like gives them the ability to rug users. But at the end of the day, you know it also could have stopped a pretty bad exploit that happened at the compiler level. So there's trade offs and everything, and it's just I think it's gonna it's I'm gonna, it's kind of nice that the protocols are and the and their users are left to the ones to kind of like determine with some market forces where who has the best strategies but uh so yeah again thanks for pointing out kind of some of the trade-offs there with this design and i, I kind of want to take the time now to dive into sfrax and you mentioned some early signs of growth and no kidding man that thing's already up to 35 million in deposits in like you know 48 hours or something like that which is incredible to see and you know when you think about this product like if it kind of feels like the perfect product to me and so like if there's any sort of demand for this thing I, it's hard for me to sit here and say like, oh no, like people aren't going to love that. And if you look at uh, demand for SDI, I think that just broke up to like 1.6, 1.7 billion. Um, so the market kind of is proving that there is indeed demand for this. And I appreciate your color a couple questions ago on about like actually how that collateral shifts. And that's also built on on market demand. And so this kind of gets to the point uh, that duration duration mismatch. Like if let's say there's some like, uh, you know, hyperbolic scenario where, 100% of the frac supply is somehow in this S frac contract, which again, probably not, not possible, but let's just assume that for a second. And it's like all of a sudden, you know, it's a weekend and everybody wants to withdraw or redeem their tokens for whatever reason. Like, how do you kind of like avoid this duration mis mismatch that you get when you're kind of dealing with these slightly more liquid RWAs? Yeah, that's a good, great question, right? Uh, I think the the issue or the limitation, right, is that T plus one and a lot of T plus two for, for brokerage, TradFi brokerage and, and stuff, uh, settlement, right? For people that, that don't know, T, T plus two means that it takes two days to settle stuff, one day for like the wire to go through. And then the actual brokerages that uh, settle the shares, T bills or these kind of things uh, take a while for them to actually settle the real, real payment, right? And then also might be even an extra day longer if we uh, have to convert things to like Paxos, USDP, Circle, or something like that, right? Because that that layer also is, is added. I think overall in the coming few years, this stuff will be uh, entirely solved even in TradFi piping. However, Frax does have some unique uh, ways to combat that and keep the peg tight uh, as well. But first, the TradFi answer is uh, FedNow. Right. Fed now is like the first time the Fed actually is trying to do instantaneous payment settlement. Uh, so you don't need a day for, you know, wires to vent. They're instantaneous if both sides of the institutions actually have this. Uh, in the future, hopefully, if again, if FinRES PBC has some kind of relationship to directly to the Fed or even just through a partner bank, you can instantaneously at least settle the wires. Right. Like there's there's still the, the way to. Uh, you know, need to change it to fiat coins or, or something like that. But the that kind of settlement dramatically, dramatically makes things faster. And, and I think FedNow is actually online and it's slowly being integrated by uh, TradFi institutions. The second thing is uh, FXBs, Frax bonds, right? Frax bonds are a, like I said, a utility token that has a timestamp on them. So there's different ones. There's different expiry uh, FXB tokens. 
and you can issue them like governance can issue them from the factory, the FXB factory, and they convert to one frac stablecoin when they're at maturity, right? So let's say it's a super long weekend, three days or something, right? And uh, there's one of those classic crypto panics. Everyone knows the money is there. Everyone, uh, you know, again, if, if you're not, uh, you know, doubting the actual collateralization, you know that this is just a time, like you said, a time duration mismatch of being able to redeem versus people wanting immediate liquidity now over like a, a few days or something, right? So what you can do is you can issue a short dated uh, frax bond through governance, right? Something that, you know, uh, you, know you, you sell it now through the on-chain auction system, People buy it probably at a very, very slight discount, right? So they earn some yield when it converts to FRAX. And for basically allowing uh, the protocol to raise uh, on-chain funds, aka USDC liquidity, so people can actually exit all of the FRAX supply without actually needing to uh, wait for the wire, right? So FRAX actually is a very, very unique, a, a lot of different levers to fix these situations. But I personally don't think it's a problem in the next one to two years due to the actual TradFi piping. But we actually thought about all this stuff. What happens if there's, uh, I don't know, there's a um, real world asset uh, compliance problem or this or that, or we can't do something for two weeks, but the, the, the collateral is there. But like, uh, given the uh, unpredictable nature of like off-chain, on-chain stuff, uh, you know, we can't redeem everything or things this as quickly. That's where FRAX bonds come in in their other use, which is, you know, raising uh, funds now at a slight discount to people who are very confident that this is just a time duration mismatch, right? The, the collateral is all there. They'll be more than willing to, you know, buy an FXB, right? At like, 99 cents whatever uh on on the dollar or something right and they'll get one frac stable coin at peg in like two weeks a week whatever right and so that's very powerful that that lever uh is something that you know governance can always lean on i think frax is probably the only one that can uh really do that i think maker can also maybe do some kind of super fast DSR stuff, right? Or, or whatever, like, you know, jack up the DSR, EDSR or whatever to like eight, 10, 12. It kind of does somewhat similar things, um, but we've thought about it, right? And so that's our, our answer. And I think it would work really well. Okay, that's super interesting. So FXBs, are they going to exclusively be used, be, exclusively be used as sort of like a, a backstop in a certain scenario? Uh, or would they also be used for like other purposes? Like, I don't know, I could have vision where even in like re regular climates, people would be interested in kind of, you know, buying an FXP at a discount and kind of creating like almost this yield curve. Yeah, they're, they're definitely not uh, used for like emergencies. They're part of the Frax V3 strategy overall, but they're very, very, very flexible, right? Um, and so the thing is you can use them in an emergency, like I was saying, but the main function is to actually, like you said, bring the yield curve entirely uh, on chain right now, the short end of the yield curve, right? The current IORB rate is super high. So everyone just wants to uh, tap into that. But as that rate goes down, what will be more enticing is for people to say, hey, uh, you know, like a five year US T bill has like, you know, 4.9% yield or something, or a 10 year has like 5.7, whatever it is, right? I want to buy that now, lock that rate in right now. I want to actually uh, have that, and that sounds good to me. Uh, rates are, you know, going down. I want to have that long, dated uh, rate locked in. Well, FXBs can do that, right? If you have a five-year FXB uh, duration, or a ten-year one, or like a one-year, whatever it is, right? Uh, these are just utility tokens. They just have a timestamp, and you just buy them on chain through an auction mechanism. And then once the timestamp hits, you can trustlessly come and just redeem it one-to-one -one for a frac stablecoin. That's all it does, right? And so it just creates this these dot plots on the yield curve of uh, yield over the long period of time to that maturity date, right? And the thing about it is that even though it doesn't entitle you to like the, the T-bill itself, it, it's not like it's security offering. It doesn't actually mean that if you hold a 10-year FXB in some way you can get or redeem or like are entitled to a 10 year T bill because you know, you can get a, a decentralized stable coin in 10 years. It should match relatively give or take uh, the, the same type of yield, right? That's how we expect it to work. It's not uh, like a, a legal 
offering. There's no like redemptions early or like a redemption to like a, a corporation or something that holds it. It's just a utility token. And so I think that that's how you build a, a yield curve on chain using, you know, utility tokens, DeFi primitives and stuff. I love that. That's, that's super, super interesting. And we think about like protocol revenue, is there going to be a fee on the FXB product or the SFRAX product? Uh, yeah, it's kind of actually built in, uh, in the sense that, you know, the, like, for example, the, the SFRAX product tries to hit the IORB rate, but it doesn't guarantee it, right? Again, it's not like some kind of legal right or some kind of like uh, investment prospectus, which it basically just means whatever the real world asset strategy gets, right? It will return to the yield vault every week. And so if people are like, oh, uh, so slightly below the IORB expectation, they can just unstake and like sell their fracks, right? And so the the spread between like what the, the protocol can take uh, as, as like a protocol fee and then what it returns can just be set by governance, right? It's kind of baked into the whole uh, structure. It doesn't like... Um, it doesn't like constrict the the protocol in some kind of fixed you know fee of like 0.3% 0.2 or whatever it's just whatever works best for the hitting the target and then uh the spread between the target and and the actual real world asset strategy is it the same for the fxbs just uh any fees associated will be uh set by governance if any at all yeah and and the the idea with that is the same uh concept slightly different consideration right like if you have a 5 year fxb uh, ideally, like let's say five year, you know, T bill yields like 4.7 or something. Uh, as long as the FXB yields 4.7 or less, that spread uh, can can be captured by the protocol in some way. Interesting. Okay, that's super interesting. That's super cool. And so on the SFRAX vault, then. Uh, do you know approximately what that take rate looks like today? Since it's only 48 hours, it's too early to tell, but like just we, we have been looking at it like deeply, right? Um, and I would say right now between like point like one to point three uh, percent of the of the TVL, right? So like the target right now is around five percent, but like uh, you know, short dated T bills and, and things yield between 5.4 to 5.5. And there's always obviously in TradFi, there's some kind of brokerage middleman things and stuff. So once you slightly take those down, it becomes like 5.2, 5.3% total yield. And then the target is, <clears throat> excuse me, right around, uh, 5.0 to 5.1. So that spread is, is what, uh, the protocol can take. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right, that's that's clear to me now. Okay, so and when I start thinking about the SFRAX token itself, it seems like a pretty good collateral in DeFi, and it, it seems like people would you know be a, have an attraction to kind of like either you know doing some looping strategies or just using it in general. When you think about like protocol integrations, is that something you spend time on? Is you know it seems like it obviously would be a great fit for FraxLend and uh, given Curve's new lending platform, it's kind of be an exciting uh, thing for me to see there as well. Yeah, I mean, it's like kind of similar to SDI, which is the, even though they're, they're kind of seem like they're named the same, it's like the DSR die and then the staked fracks uh, things. And they, they work slightly differently, but they're about the same. Uh, we I've seen a bunch of curve pools being made recently, both by Mitch and like the extended curve uh, community that pairs CRV USD with SFRAX, SDI, and these kinds of things. I think they'll be uh, huge, right? I, the, a, a pillar and in DeFi in terms of bringing the uh, expected IORB rate to actual, you know, DeFi primitives, AMMs, lending protocols. I, I think um, our goal is just to be the base layer, being able to actually provide this, right? Kind of the same way that if you think about it, the, the Fed is just in the business of uh, pushing the currency out and adjusting that kind of uh, inflation rate, right? Or, and, and interest rate as well to, to adjust the inflation rate. So um, our goal is just do our job, get the you know FXB yield curve, SFRAX IORB rate, and then let people uh, integrate it where it makes sense. And obviously we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of usage in just 48 hours. 
That's awesome. Yeah. No, I love it. I, I was uh, poking around the the curve telegram yesterday and, and did see Mitch talking a ton about it. So he's definitely got his eyes on it as well. But uh, you mentioned Paxos earlier. What exactly is the relationship between Frax and Paxos and, and kind of how are they assisting you and the team? Uh, yeah, for sure. First of all, the, the, the Paxos team is awesome. Uh, I, I'm a little bit since they're a corporation, I'm a little bit limited on exactly what I'm allowed to say. Uh, but other than saying uh, they're super cool. They've been very, very helpful and, and innovative, uh, especially with recently working with PayPal to issue PYUSD. Uh, what we are thinking of, of doing and, and working together is that if there's a way for basically the FRAX protocol and, and like Paxos uh, and like Paxos issued stable coins to achieve goals of like for them on chain liquidity, on chain uh, reliable, you know, protocol owned liquidity. And for us, uh, being able to work with partners through FinRES BBC and, and our custodians and stuff to be able to service SFRAX, FXBs, and these kinds of things, I think they're the, the perfect partner in that way. And that's basically what a lot of the, the discussions have been around. Uh, I think that we'll be able to actually announce some more you know, concrete uh, stuff pretty soon, especially with, uh, with their end letting me you know, talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I don't this kind of might be the same type of question then just given, you know, PayPal's the another corporation that kind of has some limitations around what they can say is going on, but uh, I know you were talking about PYUSD when it came out and uh, any interesting things you can tell us about the integrations between Frax and PYUSD? Yeah, like uh one of the things that will be really cool is that I think as PayPal uh, really gets going and accepting PYUSD internally in, in their system for as, as dollars, right? Uh, all of the merchants that accept PayPal, which is like pretty much as much as Visa and MasterCard, right? Uh, will immediately be able to accept uh, PYUSD. And like overnight, that's like a very, very big switch, like just turned that it's like, you go from, you know, maybe like, what is it right now? A million merchants worldwide or something like that, accepting some form of crypto or whatever to like 80 million or something insane, right? Like an 80X uh, overnight. And and I think that's one of the things that uh, we're really looking forward to by basically making sure PYUSD has on-chain liquidity uses and things like that for when that kind of inflection point happens. Because I think you guys know there's like all these uh news uh things that are like hyped and then they always like fall flat or they, they don't uh in crypto meet expectations or something it's like jp morgan is like thinking of doing like this thing and then you never hear about it again right or it's like you know the this like bank of america just started their blockchain division and like nothing ever happens right i think this is the one that actually once it's like you know the the switch is flipped where it's like all pay with paypal stuff uh, the dollars are abstracted to the the stable coin as well as you know just you know bank wires too at, at, in in one point of sale thing that's one of those things that there will be a very very big uh overnight uh impact that that's my view yeah i couldn't agree more with you there this is like one feels like it actually has legs just given all the 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 infrastructure i guess and and screen time i have on everyone's phones so uh, definitely rooting for that one and excited to see that flip get switched. But I do want to, I know we're coming up in an hour here and I want to be courteous of your time, but I do want to hit on the LST side of things. You guys uh, deployed that two token model between S Frax ETH and, and Frax ETH and it's worked really well. Yields have been consistently pretty much the highest and the peg has been very strong. Um, are those the two main takeaways that, that you would have as well? And, and how do you think uh, Frax ETH has gone so far? Uh, yeah, great. Uh, great question because uh, Frax ETH, uh, is our LSD for, for people listening. Uh, we like to call it an ETHPEG stablecoin, right? Like the, the, there's a two token system here, uh, which is just Frax Ether, which is you could just mint it with one ETH, right? It's just, uh, and then actually soon there'll just be a redemption contract too, in addition to whatever you can do on the curve pool, you can actually just redeem it and, and eject validators uh, with it as well. So um, it's just an ETH stablecoin, literally does not get any yield or anything. And then you can, stake the Frax Ether in a staking vault called S Frax Ether. So it sounds kind of familiar, right? It looks almost uh, identical in economic structure to Frax and S Frax. And the reason for that is that's how money works, right? There's like a risk-free rate internal to the system. Uh, literally, like for people listening, it doesn't mean no risk. It means 
the closest thing to the low lowest risk uh, interest in, in Ethereum is running validators by a competent and honest party, right? That's basically the lowest risk uh, interest in, in the actual system. For dollars, again, it's, it's lending short term to the Federal Reserve or the US government, right? And so you can come mint these Frax Ether stable coins. You could either use them in LPs. You can use them uh, as like, you know, a WETH replacement in Frax chain. They'll be able to be used as gas payments itself for, for the actual roll up. Uh, they have utility, right? You can use this token or you can just come and stake it in the staking vault that gets all of the, the POS rewards from uh, validators, right? And like you said, because there's people using it for currency for LPs on curve for other integrations, bridging them to, to other chains, there are uh, less people that uh, or less Frax Ether that shares the total validator rewards, right? So if, if all, there's a bunch of validators and they make some amount of yield, uh, if half of the supply of Frax Ether is just being used as money, right, just being used as stuff, and then only the other half are sharing all of the POS rewards, that's twice as high uh, APR for SRAC ETH than something like Wreath or Steeth, uh, where the interest rate is always paid out to everyone and there's no way to actually build a monetary premium. There's no way to issue like a currency, uh, so to speak, because you're, you're forced to pay the interest rate on everyone. Like n whether people are using it as, as a currency or not, you your token must pay the interest rate equally. Uh, and so that, like you said, that's why the uh system has worked so well uh that's why we always like to say it's like a eth pegged stable coin and lsd system because if you think about it that's how all of the best dollar peg stable coins work die s die frax s frax right and and they have monetary premium and then people go and get the you know the risk-free rate internal to the system right when they want when they need when it's high enough when it makes sense and uh that's kind of the same way that TradFi works, right? You have a checking account and you have a savings account, right? Your, your checking account, you make payments and it usually gets much less interest rate, right? Like nearly uh, insignificant, but then you have a savings account, whether it's used to put money in money market funds or like uh, it, it pays a much higher interest similar to the, the risk-free rate and you move money based on if you're using it for, you know, as cash, you know, a settlement media or as a savings, as a uh, you know, a savings account, right? And so we have the same model for Frax Ether uh, as we do with Frax. And as you can see, like Maker has with, with DAI and SDAI. And I think that proves it's definitely on the right track, right? When you see more and more uh, things using uh, this design, this economic model, right? So it's been it's been really good. Love to hear that as well. And, and you're right, you can, you can, there are some striking similarities there. It's almost like you guys have a master plan or something, but uh you know, you just shipped Frax V3, so it's kind of even weird to be like, okay, well, what's next? But, you know, Frax ETH has, uh, has its V2 coming in. So what can people expect uh, to see some major changes around uh, to the, the model there? Because one of the common criticisms of Frax ETH is like, oh, Sam's just running all the validators in his basement. So how, how can we get that to change? Yeah, uh, I run very good validators in my basement, top rated on on rated network, the the best. But <laughs> anyway, uh, no, but uh, so the the V one uh, for Frax ETH, as you said, um, the validators are basically whitelisted, similar to Lido, right? The, that had that keeps a whitelist of people who can or organizations that can run the validators. Frax ETH V one is exactly like that. The the people that can run the validators are whitelisted. To keep things simple, we've whitelisted just the Frax core team that, that runs the value. So it's like uh, basically it's it's us and our you know obviously professional infrastructure. The the funniest joke is like it's uh it's it's me, but it's actually our, our team led by Alex and 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 a few other guys. Uh, they actually have better performance than uh, anyone else uh, when you look at rated network. But yes, the V two is much more like. Uh, Rocket Pool, which is anyone can run a validator with some amount of collateral. It works slightly differently by kind of abstracting all of the, you know, lingo of like uh, a node operator or this or that. And it's actually about uh, a person coming and lending their ETH and getting out, you know, Frax ETH, right? And then a, a, another person being able to borrow 
that ETH to put inside validators and pay some interest rate, just like a lending market. And uh, if you think about it, all LSD systems are just a single two-sided lending market, right? When someone comes in to mint the LSD token, right, whether it's ETH, ETH, uh, or, or Frax ETH or something like that, they're lending their ETH into the protocol, right? And they're getting out this receipt that's supposed to, you know, on, on demand, because uh, it's pegged, be able to give back ETH, right? And for them to do that, they must get paid some interest rate. They can call it the POS rate, like, you know, Rocket Pool does, or like the, the rebasing rate or the rewards rate like Lido does. Uh, or you could just call it economically what it is, an interest rate that you get paid for putting your ETH into the, the LSD protocol. Then borrowers come and borrow that ETH, right? And we call them node operators because all they're doing when they borrow the ETH is staking it in a validator and running the validator, right? And, and basically paying an interest rate for the right to run the validator. Hopefully they make some profit. That's the only reasonable reason they would do that, right? To pay some interest and keep some of it. And it's a, it's a lending market. And so Frax ETH V2, formalizes that. Uh, anyone can come into Frax ETH V2, mint Frax ETH, and then anyone can come and borrow that ETH to put inside validators that they control, right? And then they obviously have to, since anyone can do that, they obviously have to put up some more ETH as collateral in case they, they get slashed or they're, they're not competent or something like that. But then once they borrow it and they're running the validator, they uh, there's a market set interest rate, just like how Fraxland works, just like how Aave works. The market set interest rate is uh, based on the, the amount of ETH lent and then the actual amount of interest validators are paying, right? If the interest rate goes too high, validators think, okay, well, I'm paying more interest than I am earning in like uh, block rewards and MEV and stuff. I'm going to eject, repay my, my loan. The interest rate slightly goes down. If the interest rate is super low, people who are really good at running nodes, they're like, oh, wow, look, the interest rate is only 5%. I can make 9% with MEV or whatever and stuff. Let me borrow as much ETH as I can, spin up a bunch of uh, nodes and, and pay this interest rate, right? And it slightly rises, right? Just like a market set interest rate. And so we actually formalized that. I kind of made like a long Twitter thread about it and, and stuff. And what's really cool to see actually is, I think it was Justin Drake or someone else maybe at the ETH Foundation uh, recently, um, they actually made like a proposal for some kind of possible enshrinement of uh, ETH as an LSD just in, in the ETH protocol itself, like in Ethereum on the consensus level because of all of the recent discussions about like Lido and, and like LSDs can get too big and, and these kind of things. And what's really interesting is if you go and read that uh, post, it was either on ETH Researcher or some uh, another one of the, the research forums. It sounds exactly like everything I said with Frax ETH V2 being a lending market. And in fact, I think Vitalik even briefly talked about how it's like a lending market. I don't think they, they're they like super deep in Frax or even really know about Frax either, but they like mentioned Rocket Pool. And I was like, uh, I think you mean Frax ETH V2, but I, you know, kind of give them a, a little bit of break because we're not even really out yet with Frax ETH V2, but it's identical to to that. And, and Rocket Pool is a lending like system too. They just have different way of calling it the, you know, mint your LSD rather than lend the ETH, right? Uh, the the POS reward rate or something is the interest rate that that gets paid to the lenders, right? These are all the same thing. These are economically uh, identical. And so it was cool to see the uh, ETH Foundation guys like coming up with their own, you know, possible enshrined LSD concept. And I'm like, this is just, this is just literally exactly Frax ETH V2. We'll just, we'll share the code base with you guys if you want. Uh, that's great. I was trying to quickly pull it up. I want to say that post was from Mike Neuter, but I'm not 100% either. But yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Was it, was it, uh, it was, cause there was a few people that talked about it. Um, Oh, okay. It was it was uh, Justin Drake, and he Mike Mike shared it on Twitter. That's where I saw it. Okay, cool. Uh, but yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Yeah, it's sort of like this this thesis validation, if at the bare minimum, right? Of course, uh, there's much more to it. But it's great to hear that um, you know this it's a, an exciting design, and and so we're we're super super excited for that as well. And as a, a stake frax ETH. Uh, holder myself i'm very fortunate for the quality of your your basement validators because <laughs> i'm glad you mentioned rated.network i was po i've been poking around on that site quite a bit recently just doing some uh some work and 
it's impressive. Like you, the Frax validators are in a very impressive set. So whatever you guys are doing over there, it is most certainly professional grade and, it, and it's impressive. So thank you. Uh, of course, sir. Alex is the, the leader of that and uh, he is not in my basement. I can definitely confirm that. <laughs> definitely hope so. I hope not. <laughs> uh, I love it. But thanks again, Sam. This has been such an exciting conversation. It's always a pleasure to have these great conversations with you. We're super excited for the, you know, congrats on the launch of Frax V3 and uh, good luck with the launch of the future launch of Frax, uh, Frax ETH V2. Um, you know, we're, we're super excited. So I'd like to give you the chance just to give the audience, um, you know, where they can learn more about Frax or find you on Twitter. Of course, more, you're more of a t- Telegram guy yourself, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm on uh, Telegram and Twitter mainly just at, at Sam Gasmian, just my name. And then obviously uh, at Frax Finance, both uh, Telegram and Twitter, same thing. Uh, we're always around. So like, I think you guys know to like, just show up. Uh, literally, I always have it open as I'm working uh, all day and night. Only time I might not be around is if I'm sleeping. So uh, join us there. And uh, we have a lot of really cool stuff coming, like you said, and a few more that we we didn't get to obviously in, in a one hour discussion. So thanks for having me. Yeah, no kidding. We could probably have you on for a whole podcast just talking about the future L2. So there, you know, this won't be the last time we get to hear from Sam K on uh, Zero X Research. But thanks again. Cheers. Cheers.